and welcome to Journeys and Journals. I get to travel the back roads, the old roads of California and Oregon, now into Nevada, Washington, and that's the privilege I have today with my guest, Jess Calvert. Welcome, Jess. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. I uh, just learned you're a Portland kid. Well, that's not, not really. I just lived in Oregon for long enough to get out of the hospital, I think, and we came <laughs> back down. But the, uh, Are you telling me that the big hospital was in Portland? Maybe that's why your mother went no, there? No, uh, we, when things got tough, the tough got going, and uh, times were tough, and so my parents and grandfather and his old friends had formed a little contracting company, and they bid a job at Castle Rock, Washington and went up there and that was time for me to arrive and when time to arrive came I, I arrived and that was it so we were all uh, stuck up there and went down. Well, but, what what kind of work was it they were doing in uh, Castle Rock? It was uh, I think Castle Rock is a very big rock I'm not sure I think they were just using it as a supply of rock and uh, ah. materials uh, for here. I'm also trying to uh, think of the uh, problems of my grandfather. Uh, the, uh, as he came from Missouri in 1851. Oh my. Uh, and I guess I discussed with you he was running cattle in the South Shopes of, of uh, Sexton Mountain. Then he fell in love with my grandmother, and uh, she was a very remarkable girl from a very remarkable family. Uh, there in, uh, uh, after 1851 sometime, she had managed to go to what was called normal school. And who ever heard of a female going to college? I mean, it was just like if she'd flown and learned to fly on one wing or something, it was uh, impossible. It was impossible. So, and uh, I have a letter that my grandfather wrote to her, and he's a very lovesick young cowboy, to tell you the truth. And uh, he was uh, uh, mentioning the thrill of her cheek against his, and uh, <laughs> pretty, pretty sexy stuff there, you know. And uh, so uh, on it went, but. Uh, his genuine concern was they didn't have anything for diphtheria, they didn't have anything for smallpox, they didn't have anything for chickenpox, they didn't have anything for this, that, and the other. And the teachers were on the firing line. I mean, they were out there, and all these rural schools you get, uh, she got pictures of some of her classes, I suppose there was 50 kids in the school, mm -hmm. and. Uh, there they were, and uh, uh, he was genuinely worried that uh, she was going to get some uh, disease and, and die and be gone. Snatch for him, him for, away. Yes, and the, uh, uh, she felt that uh, God, having been so good to her, that let her get to go to this normal school, that by George she had to buck up to it and... Uh, uh, be worthy of that honor and uh, choice and uh, to proceed with her uh, work. And the, uh, so she taught for some time. Yeah, but not as long as you'd think. They, uh, my grandfather finally talked her into... Oh, I can imagine a lovesick guy like that. <laughs> the, where, did their, they, where did they live? Uh, their home is on the corner of 4th and A Street. So you're saying here in Southern Oregon. Yeah. But uh, so Portland, did you say that it was the Depression time that took them up to Castle Rock? That My, yeah, well, people just went where the work was. That was all they could do. I mean, the work isn't going to come to them, so they have to pack up and go. Well, and now, Jess, you tell me what year, because that's the year you were born. Oh, well, 1922. Things were tough. Yes, and the uh, other thing is that when I couldn't tell these politicians now, when, when I was young, people would say, oh, it looks like tough times this winter. Yeah, not much business, not much everything. So then everybody in Grants Pass, the city dads, 
would go out and pass a bond issue to put in sidewalks, curbs, and gutters, and paving in the city streets. Lots and, of work, huh? And lots of work. And so then, the next summer had come, and by that time, then all those fellows went to work and did these jobs and got paid, and the money came from a deficit financing because the uh, Bancroft Bond Act if you had had uh, 10,000, well, it would be more realistic, if you had $2,000 worth of street work done on your house, then the would be broken into 10 payments of $200 each, and you would pay by the year $200. And no interest whatsoever on that? 6%. Oh. And the uh, rate of inflation was crowding six, so it was the effective uh, rate of interest was about uh, about zero. About but the it, it illustrates to me I I was fortunate or unfortunate enough to spend some time in Italy in World War II. Uh, when you have a hungry person, the time for discussion is over. You can't get any discussion done. You can't get anything like that at all. The only thing in God's world you can do is fill them up and then start talking to them. And the, this, the idea at present of saying, oh, we spent too much money five years ago and blew all our wad of money, so now we've got to get even and everybody pay off their bills. Well, that isn't. That, that ain't bill paying time. That's time to have another bond issue and put in another two miles of sidewalk curb and gutter in the town so that the hardworking workmen can get out there and do something. Well, now, you can remember when there wasn't pavement in Cape oh, Junction good or grief. It was, Portland, probably, they had spots with no pavement. I don't know. And the what we did lose, though, and it makes me so sad, I was less than 12, and I was a neighbor boy, about six. And our mothers became fast friends. So then the young lady, her husband was transferred to Seattle. And so my mother took me up there, and we went to visit them. And so we wanted, they wanted to go to the Bon Marche to see how it compared to uh, Myron Frank. Frank. So, they went there and they gave us an uh, ungodly amount of money, maybe as much as 50 cents, oh. to, we wanted to see them build Boeing airplanes. And here we were, can you imagine five and 12 in Seattle? No. And mm. they just kicked us out the door, said, now you get on that car and don't you get off of it till you see the airport. And then you get out Boeing and you can look field. at the airplane. And then come on back. And no one, I never heard anyone say anything about that being risky or stupid or dangerous or anything. A child could walk the streets of Seattle from one end to the other and be as safe as if he was home in bed at home. I mean, it was, uh, there was none of this horrible uh, child endangerment thing. Well, I, went to San Francisco uh, with my mindset from Southern Oregon. And uh, we actually had a taxi driver stop and say, girls, I'll take you where you need to go without money because this isn't safe. And we didn't know it wasn't yeah, safe yeah. because here we could, I mean, as you say, you know, Portland, Seattle, there wasn't there. At least we didn't have the fear. Now you're just a little older than I am, but it, you're talking 19 and 20. 34 yeah. that you were with this little kid. Yeah. How do you remember the Boeing field? What do you remember? Oh, Boeing? well, we are were model airplane freaks. You know, we built all, we knew all their models and they were, well, like General MacArthur says, in war, our second place is in war is the hoot. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, uh, there was a lot of people who thought almost tops is good enough for you know, Ford's are almost as good as Plymouth, so they're probably all right. But of course, they gotta have a bigger margin than that. 
and uh, there were a lot of airplanes that failed the test to be just skysweepers, you know, they, they had all their faults and everything. And the, uh, uh, so that uh, there was no, at the time we took that walk, there was no premier uh, fighter airplane or no premier, the Boeing 17 had not been invented yet. Uh, the B-25 and B-24s and all the, the standard uh, aircraft of World War II had not been designed yet or anything done with them. But to see Boeing Field, what was that like for a lad and his little... Oh, oh I, I think that if someone said, hey, kid, if you saw off your arm, we'll let you over here and you can you kick the tire on this airplane, I'd have probably just handed my arm to the fence. <laughs> said, okay, I'll do it. I, I was lucky enough to get to go into the Beaumark, Boeing Beaumark uh, plant. Oh, yeah? And I, uh, my husband was working there, and so I asked too many questions, and he, he was asked to kind of remove me from, <laughs> and as if I knew what I was asking. No. <laughs> oh. um, Jess, you've got history on every level that I just love to mine, talk to you about cattle drives. Oh. What's, what's you? Well, I don't know what in the world the cattle are thinking about, but all this call the cattle and everything, it's just way up high. You know? hey, hey, anything like that will do it. If, if they have confidence in you and you've been feeding them all winter and everything, they kind of know your voice and all, and so you, you can yell at them. Well, then a cattle drive, they're, they're going down the road or they're going across Texas or somewhere in between. And there's a lot of more seeing to the cattle than you'd think there'd be because they like to know that uh, things are going according to plan. And, yeah. and how old were you when you were on this cattle drive? Oh, uh, well, I was from, uh, I would imagine from six to 20. Six to, years old? Yeah, but I just, uh, that, I think they still called it the drag then. I, there's about three guys that come along behind a herd of cattle, and I think they're called the drag. And if they, if one cow darts off in the woods and liable to get lost or something, or somebody from the drag has to go get them and make them come back, and they soon uh, learn to stay together and avoid all that inconvenience and go with the, uh, my most impressive story was uh, a lady that lived, drove just to Helen, gone up rough in Reddy Creek, and she, our bill, bull stayed with her. When the herd law was passed, we had to go get all these cattle, and we were getting them two and three and four at a time in uh, trailers. And so we, they, she called and said she had her bull. So we went up there and she says, I've already got him in the garage because I figured that'd make him easier to load. And so sure enough, he was in the garage and then they backed the trailer up to the front of the garage and they had a gate there and then they had a big tube of six across the doorway to hold the door shut when the wind blew and the guy had his car in that garage. And the bull got all lined up to go in and she misunderstood and someone said, okay. And she said, okay. And she said, wait, we don't have the tuba six out of the way. She spanked him on the rear with her hand and that bull walked through a tuba six. Oh. I never did. He just walked up to a, it's a tuba six, it's a strong piece uh, yeah. of wood. And he just goes crunch and it broke at his shoulders and broke at his neck and broke at the garage and he made a pile of kindling out of the two pistons. <laughs> I really <laughs> had a feeling of the power of the... Of the bull. Oh, that bull, oh boy. Hey, the, the, the car here. Yeah? The car here, does that bring any memories back to you? I uh, know, but my grandfather ran a stage line to Crescent City. Oh, good. Grandpa's name? Uh, Jesse. Jesse Lee. 
And uh, he first had, well, that's what we ought to talk about. He first had the, uh, uh, horses, and they were driven by a jerk line. Okay. And a jerk line is for the convenience of the driver. And so they had teams of six horses, and as near as I could learn, their horses were the same as cavalry horses, or not, as field artillery horses. They weren't as fast as cavalry horses, but they could pull a gun or do some honest labor uh, uh, working on something. And then if you wanted the horse to turn left, you pulled steady on the reins. If you wanted to go right, you jerked. Oh. And that's, you say a jerk line railroad and a jerk line this and a jerk line that, that's because of the jerk line that they used to uh, tell them what to do. And the horses worked in seven to nine mile trips so that the first stop from here stopped at Wilderville, seven miles out. And then the next was seven miles at Hayes Ranch up on top of the hill and then Kirby and then on Over southeast to, to, to Crescent City. Yes. And that road to Crescent City is a doozy. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was a tracker jack, and the, uh, but the uh, horses knew it better than anybody because they never worked over seven miles. So they had... They fastened up, they, they worked that seven miles, and they took the harness off, put them in the corral, put the harness on, and then said, horse, send them back. The other horse came back with the harness, put the horse on that to, to send them back. So they, they do the same seven-mile stretch twice a day. And they got really very good at it. Well, I was taken to a corral that was on just near Holland. Oh, yes, yes, the old stone corral. And that was still there, the rocks. That was just piles of rocks, kind yeah. of like a... Yeah, and then it was most sad. It uh, seemed like the old state stations worked real well for... Uh, Uh, drying bulbs, and there was a tremendous fire hazard. They burned most of them down, uh, drying gladiola bulbs in uh, old uh, uh, stations. Huh. And That's after the uh, cars came in and what? Yeah. Well, now, the train. Yeah. You've got stories about the train. Yeah. Coming to southern Oregon or? Well, the, uh, I think that people haven't changed a lot. They talk about greed and everything like that. But then Southern Pacific, when they wanted to bring down this train line through here, they caught everybody's title up by middle school. And for years and years and years, they sat on their fat rear ends down at, uh, at San Francisco and charged everybody that bought a lot around here $100 to send them a quit claim deed to their property. And it was all this smoke and mirrors. There was nothing like any of that in the world. And the uh, it was just pitiful that they got going that way. Okay, now, Jess, yeah. you're telling me as an attorney, yeah. this wasn't okay. No, uh, mm -hmm. you see. Uh, How long did you practice law here? In oh, I was trying to think. I started out about uh, 1949, and I continued till I was uh, 30, till I was 62, and that would have been 1984. Well, I know you did a, a long term, a yeah, long well, term indeed. Well, as the law is good to, to, to is good to, I've, I'm not, uh, I, I could never be Melvin Bell if I tried to do it for a thousand years, but uh, I, there's things for me to do in the law that worked out, you know, very nicely for me. Great. When I found this picture, 
these, this is actually, you know, the wheeled vehicles of the, oh, those beautiful wheels. You know, Mrs. Uh, Hall had wagon wheels. And uh, they were on the TV show with her one time when I interviewed her. She had them that came from Kirby. Uh, I think I just, no, it came from Murphy. There yeah, that would be the Murphy Mellon. There was a stage that would go over to Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. But that's before my time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, the uh, Mrs. Helmer, I think I thought that was Helmer, but the uh, Helmer's the, had a furniture store, didn't they? Yes. That? And then uh, her predecessor was a family called Bannard, and the two Bannard girls lived at the corner of C and Fifth Street, where the library is now. And they were single ladies, and they also were students of the history and, and like that, academicians, so to speak. What? And so uh, that's what they did, but their father was the furniture store. He was the Gates Furniture of 1880 of that, of that era, huh? Yeah, and so uh, then when he, they all died and so on, why the uh, the uh, excuse me, train is out there. The ladies they, had the books of the store. These two daughters. Yeah, and there was a charge to Amos Voorhees for $50 for furniture. And then later on, there was additional furniture, $75, uh, paid in full, $125. And I could just imagine Mr. Bannard saying, now Amos, it's about time for you to take care of that little bill we have down there at the store. Well, you get all this nice new furniture and do these things. But the one I liked about her was that there was a lady by the name of Kelt. Her husband was a car dealer and someone else. And a nice guy and became an FBI agent named uh, Don Williams. And the second Miss Banner, they had never married, both girls. And she was dying. And these people weren't very good at practicing their Episcopal religion. So they were pretty rough around the edges when it came to uh, what to do. But they decided that, well, they'd get the priest and they got the prayer book and they did everything else. And they went in there and they had a service for the dying. And uh, throughout that, Ms. Banner stood there lying just like a mummy or a sphinx or something. And so they got through the whole thing as best they might and thought, well, they'd done a blow for God Almighty and that everything was all right. And so the next morning, one of them went back to sea and she had recovered completely. Not only that, she was mad as hell because they had tried to put her away just a little bit too quick, you know. And so she said, I know what went on in this room last night. And <laughs> so, uh, I don't know how they ever smoothed that one over. Well, because there were other maiden sisters, and these were business women, the Smith sisters and the oh, Schmidt yeah, sisters, yeah. and now the Banning sisters. Oh, they and they the, were all, and your mother-in-law, no, your grandmother, was it, who yeah. was a professional teacher? Yeah. And we're talking 1800s. They're remarkable girls, remarkable girls. And not only that, they were subject to uh, 
uh, continual barrage of male harassment. Uh, uh, oh, I suppose you think that you're so smart you could run Standard Oil, you know, and just, oh, just talk terrible to them. And, uh, and how do you know that? Huh? How do you know well, that? I heard him. I mean, my, my father, my grandfather was terrible that way. He uh, uh, spoke of, uh, uh, oh, and then um, she would say, well, if someone were to do this, why, then they'd make some money on that. And he says, oh, you female executives, you make it sound so easy. You know, and then uh, talking away, just really giving it Well, how did time. you get to be such a nice guy with a grandpa <laughs> like that? Oh, well, they really loved him. And they, they really loved each other, so that was real good. Well, it, it is an interesting world because a lot of the West has women's footprints on them, and women weren't. Oh, yeah. Well, my grandmother on my mother's side was up in southern Idaho, and times were tough, and so the tough got going. And she made woolen gloves for guys to work, and this was just wool off the sheep and knit into nice warm gloves. And I don't think she ever got to the point of putting a leather lining in the palm, right. but it was such good, strong, long wool that it lasted. And uh, Kept in, bread in, on a year, in a year or two, she had people coming all over to get her gloves, you know. they. Oh, thank you for telling me Grandma's story. I just could sit here all day and listen, but maybe you'll come back. Oh, well, it's, uh, well, it's just the gospel truth. They, uh, uh, also, well, I think a lot of times the men were the heavy hitters and the, the women were the planners. They, they would sit around and think about that. And Well, if that guy's always carrying a load down from so-and-so and that guy's always carrying a load down from so-and-so, we can put him here and... <laughs> Send them down Thank here. you so <laughs> much, Jess, for being my guest. Come back again real soon. Okay, well, the pleasure is all mine. I'm Bernie Beck saying thanks for tuning in. Wow, what stories.